were good. Movie fans had it good in the 90s. So good that many of our favorite hit movies got their own animated TV shows. Even ones that seem like really odd choices. Like, remember the Jumanji TV show? Or how about Free Willy the Animated Series? No? Well, that was about a boy and his pet killer whale. A sentence that makes no sense now that I'm saying it out loud. Wait, Willy was basically that kid's Uber ride. But there was one movie that totally deserved an animated adaptation. An inventive sci-fi romp with a lasting cultural footprint and a hit theme song featuring a CGI alien straight out of the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> song is so catchy, I'm never gonna get that out of my head. Wait a minute. Oh. Wait, where was I? Seriously, who all, am I? Just read the teleprompter. Oh, yeah. Anyway, Men in Black was the perfect movie to adapt into an animated series. It's a show about high-tech alien races, intergalactic mysteries, out-of-this-world gadgets, literally, and straight-up disturbing creatures. <laughs> All right, tell me it doesn't look like Rodney Dangerfield and a teddy bear had a baby. This is everything you didn't know about Men in Black, the series. Men in Black, the series ran for four seasons, which is rare for an animated kids show. There were 53 episodes, which is one more than Batman Beyond, but nowhere close to Batman the Animated Series, which had 85 episodes. You know, two little shows y'all might remember. Funny guy. So what made MIB so great? Well, it was funny. Okay, little red riding hood, free. Action-packed and represented kid sci-fi at its best. In fact, its success as one of the first original action shows for Kids WB helped brand the network as the home for quality kids action well into the late 90s and early 2000s. I'm talking about some of the best shows ever made. Nah, not that. I meant like Jackie Chan Adventures or something. Damn it. How am I need to neuralize that song out of my brain? Hold on. Here's the thing about Kids WB. Its first hit show, The New Batman Adventures, didn't make it to Kids WB until 1997, two whole years after Kids WB launched in 1995. So what filled the airtime until then? Lots of broad comedies like Pinky and the Brain and fresh episodes of Animaniacs after coming over from Fox. Which I love, but MIB was a bold departure from anything Kids WB had ever done, thanks in part to its much darker tone. But that's what made it so great. It was fun enough for kids and dark enough for adults. And it lets you know right away because the opening has some serious X-Files vibes. By the way, aside from the music, what I love about the opening is how much they live straight from the movie. Just to make sure you know it's based on the thing you already loved. Like Agent J breaking out that tiny little gun. Noisy cricket. Or how Kay's car transforms and drives on the ceiling of the Midtown Tunnel? MIB the series was incredibly original and even sophisticated. I mean, what other show for kids bases plots around labor disputes on alien planets? I have been having some trouble replenishing my supply of neuralizer cores due to a labor dispute in the Varshimic Quadrant. All right, I have no clue what they're talking about. Probably because I have no brain cells left from, you know, doing this like three times. But audiences loved it. The first season had good ratings, which was crucial for the fledgling network who were an afterthought compared to Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon. I'm gonna go ahead and give all the credit to the Worms. Worms to the rescue. Is it weird that they're naked or, well, actually, now that I think about it, Worms with clothes may be weirder. I don't know. By 1999, Kids WB was getting higher ratings than ABC Kids and Nickelodeon shows like Rugrats, only two years after MIB's premiere. Now, to be fair, Pokemon had also premiered, which helped the ratings spike, but MIB played its part and we loved it, even when it was complete gibberish. Don't want all the king's men putting eggshell in my little red tugboat. When flapjacks fly, yum yum, gotta clip the toenails to tweak. And by 2000, Kiss WB had greenlit a slew of other action shows like Jackie Chan Adventures, Max Steel, and a personal favorite, Static Shock. I put a shock to your system. Oh, and don't forget Batman Beyond, which actually led to some pretty dope crossover marketing promos. Hey, Batman. Yes? I love it when they do that. Soon, Kiss WB became such a hit that it outlasted its own network. When the WB station shut down in 2006, the Kiss WB Saturday morning block aired on the CW until 2008. 
It was basically a network in disguise, like Agent J going undercover. Now, here's the thing about MIB the series. It didn't really gain its footing until later on. A lot of the first season was just repeating the movie. Like, remember the park bench scene where Will Smith decides to join MIB? This is the spot where I decided to join the MIB. Or that funny scene where the tentacle baby launches Agent J in the air. <laughs> oh, and then there's even an early episode based entirely around the one training scene in the movie. You know, like where he shoots the little girl Tiffany, who, by the way, totally deserved it. Quantum physics books? Come on. She about to start some shit, in. And of course, the show brought over all your favorite gadgets, like the noisy cricket. <laughs> noisy cricket! You can't miss an opportunity to promote the toy line. Not to mention the sweet Burger King promotion. This classified. Man, it's too bad I can't remember if I ever got those Burger King toys when I was a kid. I want to forget all about this. But my favorite gadget was definitely the car. Oh, it's so good. I mean, who else can make a 1987 Ford Crown Victoria look cool? Maybe Exhibit. I'm about to pip your ride. Let's go. And just like the gadgets, the premise and the characters were basically the same as they were in the movie. For one, the show incorporates all of the events of the movie except Agent K's retirement, meaning that the show takes place in a different timeline, one where we finally get an E.T. prequel. Mr. Spielberg's holding on line four regarding the E.T. prequel. The timeline is a small but important tweak. Producer and story editor Dwayne Capizzi explains why. And I quote, we felt MIB's main dynamic was between the Will Smith and the Tommy Lee Jones characters. So rather than coming up with the true sequel, which Amblin and Columbia will probably do anyway, we decided to ignore the ending and continue the adventures, end quote. However, the original cast does get a name drop. We've got talking penguins, icebergs, Will Smith, Tommy Lee Jones, Rip Torn, blah, blah, blah. It's a slam dunk. Dwayne Capizzi went on to develop another WB Kids mainstay, Jackie Chan Adventures. He was a master at developing shows based on established characters. Characters like Agent K, Jay's cranky, blunt mentor who loves pissing off bikers. Not pissing on. Two different things. Have any of you little girls seen Jimmy the Runt? Little girls? Little girls! Notice that he doesn't quite look like Tommy Lee Jones. And he definitely doesn't sound like him. And the answer you're looking for lies right here. Don't forget to file your tax returns. K was played by voice actor Edo Ross, but replaced in the second season by voice actor Greg Berger. Wait, didn't I just talk about another character he recently voiced? The hideous monster called The Grumble, voiced by Greg Berger. And then there's Agent J, who was voiced by actor Keith Diamond. Like in the movie, he's the fun-loving rookie who's always cracking jokes and definitely has the right priorities. We here to talk to him? Nope. Good, because the girls who I want to talk to but notice he's missing Will Smith's mustache, which is another slight tweak from the movie. I make this look good. But the most drastic physical differences involve Agent L and Zed. In the movie, Zed's the big boss played by Rip Torn. Let's put it on. Put what on? The last suit you'll ever wear. Who looks nothing like this dude. Kid needs to have his skull checked. Though his voice is super intimidating. That's probably because it was played by Charles Napier, who played Murdoch in Rambo First Blood Part 2. I didn't know it was supposed to happen like this. It was just supposed to be another assignment. Also, in the movie, Agent L is a brunette played by Linda Fiorentino, who had her own run-in with a government agency when she was embroiled in the FBI prosecution of private investigator Anthony Pelicano. It's crazy, right? Anyway, they made her a blonde in the show. I have my methods. But all of these little changes were necessary because the show didn't have the rights to any of the actors' likenesses. So they had to make small tweaks while capturing the characters' spirits. And they totally nailed it with interactions like these. I even make these shoes look good. No. 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 You've been looking for 20 minutes. It's not the ball, it's the bowler. But they didn't have to change any of the alien side characters, except the worms, who kicked their smoking habit since this is a kid's show and replaced it with a weird obsession with the Baldwin brothers. Well, it's bigger than the Baldwin brothers. That's f***ing random. But every other alien from the movie remained the same. How do I know? Because they're all in the show. Of course, there's everyone's favorite mouthy dog, Frank the Pug. Catch this vibe. I only look like a dog. They had to bring back Jeebs, who definitely got his head blown off again. <laughs> Jeeves was voiced by Tony Shalhoub in a handful of episodes, like in season one, episode four, The Alpha Syndrome. Hey, I don't speak ill of your career. By the way, all the episode titles started with The and ended with Syndrome. <laughs> but Shalhoub is not the only voice actor to make an appearance from the movie. So you're the man in black who 86 my brother? Yep, that's Vincent D'Onofrio. 
he played all the bugs, including Edgar via flashback, as well as Edgar's twin brother, Edwin. I'm much better looking. I'm telling you, the writers found a way to use every alien from the movies, like the twins and even the little dude inside the person's head. All right, technically they're called Archillians, just getting that out of the way, just in case they're real and are watching this. Now, because the show took so much from the movie, it felt very familiar early on. But as it progressed, it began to make much more interesting choices, like how they empathize with aliens, even giving us a glimpse into their romantic lives. Will I see you again? It's a small galaxy. And they incorporated sci-fi concepts in inventive ways, like how they made the idea of quick clones an integral part of the show. Quick clones aren't reliable. <laughs> they think and act exactly like their human counterparts. They also expanded on the tech, adding new gadgets to enhance some killer action scenes. Anti-gravity shoes. Zed must like me better than you. Not to mention, the show was way ahead of its time. I seem to recall plenty of research that said a woman being elected president was impossible. And as the show went on, it began to develop its own visual style based on designs by Miguel Ancho Prado, the Eisner Award-winning Spanish comic artist. His striking visual style can be found in some of the show's best designs, like the villain Alpha. With one fell swoop, we can cut the planet's defenses off at the root. Alpha is a great villain with a cool backstory. He was the first agent MIB ever had before becoming one of the show's arch villains, along with the Bug Queen. She puts a bounty on Agent J for killing Edgar in the film, which again is another great connection to the movie. I squashed your bad boys Edgar and Edwin. I'm the one you want. Is it just me or does her character look like little Tiffany from the movie? Other fun new characters included Troy the symbiote, who dreamed of becoming an MIB agent. He pops out of Jay's head and appears in the only Halloween-themed episode of the series, The Jack-O-Lantern Syndrome, which features one of the scariest old ladies in any horror movie ever. Jack-O-Lantern steals away children on All Hallows' Eve, then sucks out their bones to make their parents grieve. Ugh. Nope, nope, nope. I can't have that in my head. I will never sleep again. There's a reason the later seasons start to deviate much more from the movie, and it's basically because the writers had more time to develop characters like Agent X, Agent L's antagonistic partner. <laughs> Waste of my time and talent. Isn't that right, Decap? That's what I call Dwayne Capizzi. I'm kidding, we don't know each other. He says, and I quote, we got out of the gate on season one so quickly that we had very little development time. Between the seasons, we were able to go in and discover what was working and what wasn't, and we kind of fine-tuned everything, end quote. The fine tuning led to some creative episodes like when they go to Hollywood and discover that all the aliens in those 1950s B-movies were real. <laughs> or when they visit a planet based on ancient Rome. Hi, Joe! Let the battle begin! And when they travel back in time to the Wild Wild West, possibly a call out to Will Smith's movie, Wild Wild West. But my favorite episode is when Jay swallows an alien egg and becomes pregnant. Nothing unusual at the Empire State Building, besides the pregnant guy and his alien nursemaid. Which I know is a call out to the movie Junior. I'm gonna be a mama too. All right, it wasn't. I just wanted to mention what a weird movie that was. Now, MIB the series was produced by Adelaide Productions, a division of Columbia TriStar and eventually Sony. They produced cartoons like Jumanji the TV show, Callback, also extreme Ghostbusters and Jackie Chan Adventures, double callback. But here's the thing, just like Kiss WB, MIB was one of their first shows and you can totally tell early on. Well, you all seem to be taking my predicament a little lightly. Wait, did Jay's hair turn gray? Also, look at the scale of these characters. All right, either that car shrank or Jay's 15 feet tall. And the alien designs early on were fairly generic looking slugs with really bad hygiene. The animation hit its stride later on as they brought in some serious talented directors, like famed comic book writer Darwin Cook, who revived the spirit and directed three episodes. Just look at how much more fun these episodes looked later on. <laughs> MIB's animation was done by Korean animation studios Lotto Animation and Dong Woo Animation, who frequently collaborated. Some of their credits include Justice League, Turtles Forever, and shows we've mentioned earlier like Jackie Chan Adventures and Static Shock, among others. Men in Black the series was like a mirror reflection of Kids WB. As it evolved, it became more and more popular, and people noticed. In 2002, MIB won a daytime Emmy for sound editing, finally getting some well-deserved recognition, though it coincided with the show's fourth and final season. 
you know, the one where they changed a bit of the intro. I mean, at least they didn't make any big changes because they knew that intro was fire. I mean, come on, that dance? It's cold. But don't worry, they still kept the end theme song the same. Sorry, I'll erase that from your lines. Hold on. While it's sad that the show ended after four seasons, it could have been worse. It was rumored that the show was only supposed to go three seasons, which is why the season three finale reads like a series finale. In it, Agent J is fired from MIB and neuralized. Sorry. <gasps> he returns to the NYPD just as the bugs invade, hooking up where the movie began, basically making J as a rookie again. Yo, man, what are you doing? Back off, Junior. You don't know what we're dealing with here. The theory is that the only reason the fourth season happened was because the movie stars had officially committed to making a sequel, Men in Black 2. The flight's been canceled. Due to the success of the fourth season, producers were planning on a fifth season and a spin-off, but obviously none of it happened. Probably because the second movie was released to underwhelming box office numbers and reviews. It's too bad because it was clear they were setting up an Astro Tots spin-off. Astro Tots. Ooh, I hate them. Sadly, the show has never had a proper DVD release. Only the first season was released in 2012. The other three seasons can only be found in our hearts or wherever this is. If you want more MIB, you can also check out the original comics that the movies were based on. Rumor has it that the show tried to get comic book creator Lowell Cunningham to write a few episodes, but it never worked out. Hey, you gotta shoot for the moon, am I right? On the moon, in an abandoned lunar rover, you're blind and I'm still riding shotgun? Rough pun, but I wanted to get that clip in. And if you want more MIB animated content, just check out the video games released based on the show, including Men in Black the Series 1 and 2 for Game Boy and Crashdown for PlayStation. Or just watch some reruns of the good old Kid WB. First up, Jackie Chan traveling round, then power up static shots in town. Damn, what an incredible lineup. Thanks for kicking it all off for us, Men in Black. Truly one of the better movie to cartoon adaptations we've probably ever gotten. Where does it rank on y'all's list of cartoons based on movies? Actually, who was your favorite MIB alien? And tell me why it's this guy. Good night, you kooky guy, and uh, don't let the bed bugs catch you a while, crocodile, hey? Let us know in the comments. Have a nice day. Thanks for watching. For more everything you didn't know, make sure you click over here. And for new episodes I drop every other week, subscribe over there. Okay. Now can somebody tell me what my birthday is?